Hi there, welcome to our revision webinar looking at uh, aspects of income and equality in the UK. Hopefully there'll be some useful contextual data for you here in terms of understanding the dynamics of inequality and in particular the gap between rich and low income in the British economy. Just a quick introduction, we need to make a, a clear distinction between income and wealth. So oftentimes students write as if they're the same thing, and they're clearly not. Income is a flow of money going to factors of production. It could be the wage or your salary from your job. It could be a flow of rental income from property, perhaps interest from your savings accounts. And if you have shares, maybe some dividends flowing to you as profits. Wealth, of course, on the other hand, is the stock of assets, the value of assets that somebody could own. You could almost take a national wealth assets ratio as well. So wealth includes the value of savings in a bank account, the market value of your property if you have one, um, stocks and shares in businesses, that kind of stuff, and wealth held in pension schemes. Talking of uh, property, I sold my house last week for £550,000, which, considering I was only renting it at the time, I thought was a good deal. Now, they're one of the guys at the moment who is just producing some absolutely fantastic stuff on inequality is Branko Milanovic. I'm sure you're all big fans of Branko's work. He is an absolutely tremendous economist. He's just written a superb new book on global inequality. He's one of those guys who comes up uh, with those kind of takeaway quotes, uh, which basically try and capture the essence of the issue. Half of one's income depends on the average income of the country in which that person was born. 8% uh, of humanity takes home 50% of global income, the top 1% takes home 15%. And they're kind of Oxfam, st Oxfam style data. The richest three people on the, on the planet have more wealth than the poorest 3 billion. Quite interestingly, he, he's done some research which found that the, the Gini coefficient for the world economy is higher than for any country in the world. So the Gini coefficient, the last data we had was around 0 0.7, which is pretty high. Whereas high income inequality in a country like Brazil is 0.6. I think the highest last year was the Seychelles, about 0.65. But if you want to really understand inequality, I definitely advise you to have a look at the work of Branko Milanovic. Just type his name into Google. He is terrific. What I thought I'd do is just quickly look at the inequality data for the UK. Lots of ways of looking at this. This is some tremendous work that's been done by the Global Inequality Index. So the data at the top is the earnings of the top decile, that's the top 10% as a percentage of the median, the middle value income. And you can see that since 1980, here we go, the earnings of the top 10% have risen from about 170% of the median to over 200% of the median, so more than double the median income. Here's the green line. Okay, the Gini coefficient is in green. The Gini coefficient went up sharply in the late 70s, early 80s. Actually, the last 20 odd years, the Gini coefficient uh, for equivalised household disposable income uh, after housing costs, I think, has been pretty flat, actually. About 0.36. Uh, it's lower than the United States, which is 0.42. So there's the Gini coefficient. The yellow bit shows the share of the top 1% in wealth. So the top 1% of about 20, 25% of the wealth. This red one shows the share of households living below the 6% of the median, and that's the, the poverty line in the UK. That's been falling gradually, helped by things like the minimum wage and also by falling unemployment. About 17% of households live below the poverty line, below 60% of median income. The one that's been going up is, the, as you can see, there's been a bit of a fall recently, the share of the top 1% in gross income has been rising. And this chart at the bottom is the share of the top 0.1% in gross income. If you lay the figures there, the top 0.1% have about 5% of gross income. So lots of inequality to think about. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, inequality by income by households in the UK. It's of 2014, I think. Uh, across the top here, we have the poorest households. And then we go across second quintile, third quintile, etc. to the richest 20% of households. And you can see that original income, that's things like income um, before any government intervention, things like wages and salaries and that kind of stuff. 
before the tax and benefit system has had its effect. Original income for the poorest fifth of households, just £100 a week per household on average. Now, with taxes and benefits, things like that goes up to 297. Keep in mind, of course, that things like welfare caps will affect that figure going forward. The government's producing the welfare cap. Whereas for the richest 20% of households, they have an original income of nearly £1,600 a week, £80,000 a year. Of course, with taxes and benefits, progressive taxes, and that comes down to about £56,000 a year, £1,100 a week or so. So there's quite a big gap, or well, huge gap, between the original income of the poorest compared to the richest. Huge gap. That comes down a little bit because of the impact of tax and benefits. Why is there so much inequality? Lots and lots of reasons. Huge amount of discussion in the economics literature about the causes of inequality within countries. I think uh, this slide just tries to capture for you some of the issues. Uh, we live in a world of globalisation. We live in a world of fast-changing labour markets. And there is probably, probably a skills bias that comes from just pure technology changes. In other words, people with high-skilled, in-demand jobs, programmers, software engineers, you know, people are using high-tech uh, equipment and facilities. There is a premium pay, a premium wage for those people compared to low-tech, low-tech, relatively low-skilled jobs. The gap, but the gap between those has widened. If you've been reading the work of Thomas Piketty, you'll be looking, thinking about the, the, his famous work on the, the fact that the share of income going to capitalists has been rising. He thinks there's a kind of fundamental dynamic which causes the rate of return on capital to be higher than the rate of interest and that income in, and generates wealth and that wealth is increasingly concentrated amongst the rich. I think generally speaking, over time, tax systems have perhaps become a little bit less progressive. The top rate of income tax in the UK has edged down from... 50% under Labour to 45. Uh, there's been some welfare cuts. There's been some increases in VAT, uh, expansion of excise duties and things, and, and a, a significant rise in lots of indirect taxes, which, broadly speaking, are regressive in nature. So tax systems have become a little bit less progressive. Welfare has been cut in certain areas. We know in the labour market there's been huge executive pay bonus issues, controversies, but executive pay has been rising much faster, a lot faster than pay for ordinary people in the workforce. There's also been a rise in, in, in work poverty, that's people who have a job, but are having to work a lot of hours to basically make ends meet. And so this, uh, this issue about the prevalence of lots of low paid, oftentimes insecure jobs in the labour market is something that is a major policy issue at the moment. The rise in in-work poverty. People who have a job, but who are still relatively poor. Um, and oftentimes in those labour markets, people are not members of a union. Take farming, for example, or leisure, or catering, or hospitality, or caring. Oftentimes in those industries, less than, less than one worker in ten is a member of a union. Trade unions generally only have about 25-26% of the employed labour force. Lots of inequality, of course, is linked to rural, urban rural differences, particularly in developing countries. That's less so in the UK, but there is some, some, some big rural poverty issues in, in Britain. And deep fissures, deep regional economic inequalities, which, which seemingly get wider with every passing recession. If you've been following the steel industry debate and the future of, of open cast mining and steel making and fishing, uh, regional inequality is there for all to see. And then another feature of globalisation, inequality caused by the hollowing out of employment in manufacturing. A lot of manufacturing, of course, has shifted out of the UK uh, towards lower cost centres. Less than two and a half million people are employed in manufacturing in Britain. A big rise in economic inactivity. Eight and a half million people in this country are inactive, but of working age. And over two million of those people would like a job, but uh, for one reason or another, can't find one. So lots and lots of Inequality, the fundamental causes of inequality are low pay, um, differences in educational opportunities, and crucially, unemployment, in particular, long-term unemployment. Okay, finally, what is being done? What are some of the policy options for trying to address this, this inequality gap in, in the British economy? Really? I've put these into four main areas. One is to, to, to re rethink welfare. 
Uh, so, for example, to what extent should the government be thinking about increasing child benefit, particularly to target um, families on low incomes? Um, pension of poverty is also a big issue. Of course, the government's brought in a triple lock there. So the state pension rises by inflation or average earnings growth or 2.5%, whichever, whichever is the higher. Uh, one can think about policy towards extending financial support to, to students in paying for tuition fees, particularly if they come from disadvantaged backgrounds. The quality of public goods makes a difference in terms of inequality. The access of public goods free at the point of consumption. Uh, little things like public Wi-Fi provision and uh, access to basic core public goods, including merit goods, including um, library provision. A lot of people now are thinking of minimum income schemes. Should there be something like a citizen's income or a basic income scheme? Should that be thought of to almost lift low-income families out of poverty? And should we reintroduce the idea of a capital endowment for young people, which you know is paid to them when they reach 18 or when they reach the age of majority at 21? A five-figure sum, which will allow them perhaps to go to university or start a business or what have you. So welfare can make a difference. So too, in theory, can consumption, income and wealth taxes. So to what extent should we be looking to the housing market to try and introduce some more progressivity into the tax system? Maybe make stamp duty more progressive or uh, change capital gains tax, what have you. Um, should we be looking to increase income tax allowances still further? There's been some significant progress there in recent years. Should there be a higher marginal rate above 45%? Should we go to 50? Is that too high? Should we go to 60? Is that too high? Should we introduce some sort of progressive consumption tax instead of having VAT at 20%? Should we have higher rates of VAT, for example, on luxury items? It's all part of the debate about inequality. And part of that discussion is the minimum wage. So, of course, the coalition government uh, raised a minimum wage and the new Conservative government has introduced a national living wage. It's not a living wage. It's a, national, it's a minimum wage, which is higher. But the whole debate about whether... That minimum wage should be rising each year. How fast? £7.20 at the moment should it be a national, proper national living wage. And crucially, uh, if you want to tackle poverty, you have to address employment rights in the, in the labour force. Tackle instances where monopsy employers are clearly paying low wages and offering poor conditions, particularly in, particularly in farming. And uh, incentives to work are fundamentally determined by quality of and the access to and the cost of childcare. No question that childcare is a big barrier to people taking work. And then we're looking at the other barriers to employment. Again, once you have people in work in a household, the risk of poverty falls. If you have two people in work, even better, but work needs to pay. But So long term, reducing inequality, thinking about better access to early years education, better school meals, links between nutritional um, calorific intake and brain development amongst the young, increasing access to new technologies in disadvantaged communities, increasing education funding on vocational subjects, tackling, um, getting more students to take STEM subjects. So that's by the way, that's science, technology, engineering and maths. It's not sociology, theology, economics and music. So STEM subjects, coding, computer science, more, more languages, different types of languages more creative subjects, building new capabilities, building more human capital, building flexibility in the labour market. And then crucially, targeted measures to get targeted measures to get the long-term unemployed back into work. Poverty risk amongst the long-term unemployed and the economically inactive is particularly high. Economists call this hysteresis, when people are out of work for so long that they effectively leave the labour market and become long-term benefit recipients. So targeted measures to get those people back into work. That's not just young youth unemployment, although that's a major issue. That's long-term unemployment across all ages. And uh, tackling discrimination in the labour market on grounds of gender, age, ethnicity, and other factors. There is a lot you can do to tackle inequality. It's, not, it's a complex subject thorny issue, there are costs and benefits, there are trade-offs all over the place. But the idea there's not much you can do is clearly nonsense. There is a lot that policy can do if governments have the ambition to do it. So this has been a look at the inequality data in the UK, um, some causes of inequality in a, in a globalising world, and a policy perspective on what 
some of the, some of the policy options to bring inequality down in the UK from current levels. Okay, thanks for joining in. Uh, don't forget our YouTube channel has lots of uh, lots of new videos every day. Uh, you can always play this back again on YouTube and and uh, add in some notes as you want. Thanks a lot. Take care. See you soon.